As I explained in my last video, dynamic programming is not about drawing tables, it's about recurrence relations. But some of y'all aren't convinced this is the right approach. Memoization can be slow, at cache isn't in every language, and DP isn't just recursion with caching. Y'all have been asking for it. The stuff you see at the top of every solution section. Bottom up. Iterative. Welcome to the sequel, where I'll show you how iterative is only a few steps away. Y'all gotta remember, dynamic programming is not a specific implementation, it's a general problem solving approach. So those ideas of using recurrence relations to represent our decisions and exploiting the observation that the consequences of our actions are relatively small still apply to building iterative implementations too. We need to put an end to drawing out tables and instead focus on studying the recurrence relations we just wrote. Think about it, if you've come up with a correct recursive solution, you've pretty much reached the highest level of understanding, a math equation. I also really like learning visually, but it's important to understand that math allows us to work in higher dimensions that are tough to visualize. This is not math. So for the greater good, I'm going to destroy our visualization of tables, and I'll show you step by step how we can use just the information in our recurrence relation to iteratively optimize our solution. I'll convert this recursive function to iterative. First, I'll figure out the bounds of my parameters. For the coin index i, the lowest it can be is my starting value 0, and the highest it can be is my base case, length of coins. So the bounds for i are 0 to length of coins. For the amount x, since I have this if check, the lowest it can be is 0, and the highest it can be is my starting value, amount. So the bounds for x are 0 to amount. Nothing in either range is negative, which means I can index these recursive terms and store their values in arrays. Arrays can only be indexed with non-negative integers, so it's important your recurrence relation reflects that in all cases. For this problem, instead of checking if coins of i is less than or equal to x, I could have had a base case that handled negative numbers. That works with recursion, but if I want to do it iteratively with arrays, that base case won't work, and I would need to put that check back in. Since I have two parameters, I need a two-dimensional array. I want my indexing to be the same order as my parameters. So starting with my first parameter i, I need to index from 0 to length of coins. So I need an array of size length of coins plus 1. So for i in range length of coins plus 1. For the other parameter x, I need the inner arrays to index from 0 to amount. So I need an array of size amount plus 1. I'll fill these up with none and it'll be of size amount plus one. Two things here. First, I chose the default initialize to none because I want to show that it doesn't matter what we put in here. If I do the next step correctly, all of these will be overwritten. Second, multiplying a list is just a short way to create a list of that size filled with the same value. However, notice that I don't do that with the outer list because unlike none, lists aren't immutable values. So I want to ensure that I have separate instances of each one. That way if I modify one, I won't modify the others. Python is concise, but it can also be tricky. Because I'm using this to store the values of my recursive terms, I'll call this num ways values. Let's review. To create the space to store our terms, we need to identify a function's valid arguments. Usually, we can evaluate each individually, and we can use base cases and starting arguments as endpoints. To store values, you should always try to use arrays, because it's extremely efficient with the fastest lookup and great cache locality. However, arrays require non-negative integer bounds to index, so consider adding an if check or one indexing to get your occurrence relation to satisfy this. It's great for compact bounds, which we use in tabulation, and in C++ we can even allocate and initialize it at runtime, tricking leak code into thinking that we are more time and space efficient than we actually are. That's how I get my n to the fourth solutions to pass when n cube is expected. If you are lazy or the dependencies are a bit odd, you can also use a map or dictionary. It works for pretty much everything and is also how add cache is probably implemented. The main use is when bounds are sparse and can be really powerful for memoization and even be faster than a naive iterative solution. You can also use it to use strings or pointers as your arguments, but it's much slower than arrays, so once again, prefer to use those. Since I want to stop using recursive calls, 
I have to handle the order in which these terms are evaluated myself. Since I already have the recurrence relation, I can just use this to figure out the order. The general term ix requires the recursive terms of take and skip. So ix requires take, which is ix minus coins of i, and skip, which is i plus 1 x. In take, for i x to be calculated, I need i x minus coins of i. So since i does not change, x depends on x minus coins of i. That means I need to calculate x minus coins of i before x. Since coins of i is always positive, x minus coins of i is smaller than x. So I have to calculate the small values before the big values. So based on these bounds, the smallest value of x is 0. And the biggest value of x is amount. To implement this order, I'll use a for loop. For x in range, starting with the smallest value 0, and ending before amount plus 1, this is the order that I need to calculate the values of my amount x. If we want to be free from the call stack, we have to understand the deal we made. When we use recursion, we give our stack frames, and in return, our terms are calculated in the correct order. However, if we want our stack frames back, we have to handle that order ourselves. Moving on to skip. For i x to be calculated, I also need i plus 1 x. So since x does not change, i depends on i plus 1. That means I need to calculate i plus 1 before i. i plus 1 is bigger than i, so big before small. So based on the bounds, the biggest value of i is length of coins, and the smallest value of i is 0. So for i in range, starting with the biggest value, length of coins, and ending before negative 1, going in descending order, this is the order I need to calculate the values of my coin index i. Because each parameter had dependencies that only went in one direction, I know the order of the for loops doesn't matter here. So I'll compute each term using the function I already wrote. num ways values i x is equal to num ways starting with to make i x. To figure out our loops, we need to identify the dependencies. In our recurrence relation, the general term, which are the parameters of our function signature, depends on its recursive terms, which are the arguments of our recursive calls. So the recursive terms must be calculated before the general term. To figure out a valid order, I follow two rules. For every recursive term, at least one argument has to match the direction of the parameters for the for loop, and the outermost loop should have dependencies in only one direction. There are certainly other ways to do this, but following just these two rules has consistently worked for me. There are a few tricky parts though. One is unchanging parameters. We saw this in the coin change problem. If one variable doesn't change, that doesn't break the order, but it does mean that it fixes the order of one of the other parameters. There's also the case of directed graphs and rooted trees, where you basically have to top sort or do a post order traversal. In these cases, it's often way easier to do memoization and let recursion handle it. Pattern matching time! I'm going to show you a recurrence relation and the bounds of its parameters, and I want you to try and figure out what the for loop should be. I'll count down from 3 before revealing the answer, but I picked some hard examples, including 2 from last week's leap code contest, so pause the video and take some time. Here's the recurrence relation and the bounds for the Catalan numbers. In both recursive calls, size decreases, so we have to calculate the small before the big. In other words, iterating from 0 to n. How about we take a swing at Floyd Mayweather's algorithm? i becomes k, j becomes k, and k could be bigger or smaller, but it's okay. None of that matters because k decreases every time. So for k, small before big, 
iterate from 0 to n, and the order of the inner loops doesn't really matter. This was question 4 from last week's contest. How do we write this iteratively? Don't let the left and right fool you, it's a lot like our coin change problem. We have two recursive terms with two unchanging parameters. Since r does not change, we must calculate l plus 1 before l, big before small, and thus n minus 1 before 0. Since l does not change, we must calculate r minus 1 before r, small before big, and thus 0 before n minus 1. Either can be the outer loop, but there's one last catch. l must be less than or equal to our r. So if r is the inner loop, our lower bound should be l, not 0. As the last example, this was question 3 from last week's contest. That double left arrow just means a left bit shift. So one left bit shift n is just 2 to the n. Ooh, scary bit manipulation. But notice i increases every time, so big before small, make that our outer loop, and it doesn't really matter which direction we go for that second loop, though it just so happens the second loop is in the correct order too. I don't want to use add cache anymore, so I'll just delete that. But I still want to treat my recursive calls as values, so that's exactly what I'll do. I'll just replace my recursive calls with the values of that term. That's just replacing names and turning parentheses into brackets. You see what I mean by treating our recursive calls as values? Why we calculate the cached complexity assuming O1 recursive calls? Look at the for loops. You see why we multiply that cached complexity by the number of unique parameter combinations? And that's it. I have an iterative solution. And the solution will pass. And this is why dynamic programming is so powerful. You take the iterative and the recursive and utilize the best of both worlds. You get all the mathematical conciseness and correctness of recurrence relations with the programmatic efficiency of cache-friendly iteration. This is why I emphasize learning it recursively first, because without that, you're missing out on the formalization that allows you to smash these two opposing paradigms into one correct, efficient technique. Since I'm done with the logic of my recurrence relation, and I'm only making optimizations, I'll replace the name of my array with a shorter one. Then I'll move the function body into the for loop. And I'll replace these return statements with assignment. and then continue to the next term. That's all it takes. Instead of returning, just store the computed value and continue to the next term. For the general case, we don't need to continue since there's no code after that anyways. I can make this even cleaner by moving this base case out of the loop, but for that I need to think a bit. For every time i is equal to length of coins, if x is 0, the answer is 1. If x is anything else, it's 0. So, I can hard code the first case when i is equal to length of coins and x is equal to 0, then the answer is 1. I can handle the second part by just default initializing everything else to 0. With this, I can remove the first iteration of i and start with length of coins minus 1. Another thing I'll do is remove these names, take and skip, and just move their values directly into the assignment. So I'll replace skip, and then take is just a conditional add. So I can get rid of this zero, and just plus equals it if the condition is true. I want to see if I can apply the space saving trick. I need to identify parameters that only depend on arguments that are constant relative to the parameter. Within my for loops, I look at what arguments I am using. For i, I am using i and i plus 1. For x, I am using x and x minus coins of i. i is increased by 1, which is constant, while x is decreased by coins of i, which is a variable.
so I can apply the space saving trick only to the parameter i. To do this, first I will replace the array accessing of dpi and dpi plus 1 with the variables dpi. and dpi1. Since i is the parameter I am saving space on, its loop must be the outer loop. This way, I can shift the values over, so the next loop's last values will be this loop's current values. In other words, dpi1 of the next loop will be this loop's dpi. We also have to store and shift every value in between. So let's say instead of i minus 1, we had i minus 3. Then we would need dpi3, dpi2, dpi1, and dpi. That way, at the end of the loop, dpi3 could shift to dpi2, which could shift to dpi1, which could shift to dpi. dpi1 represents the last states I calculated, which is everything outside of these loops. So I'll just replace those. dpi represents the current states I'm calculating each loop, so I will create that every loop. With this, I'm only using O amount space, and the solution will also pass. For the space saving trick, the first step is to identify constant dependencies, which parameters only depend on arguments with constant changes. That parameter must be outer loopable, based on the dependencies earlier. If we see multiple candidates, we can apply this recursively. After space saving one of the parameters, you can also try to space save more parameters in the inner loops too. The second step is to replace array accessing with variables. I like renaming it as a parameter constant pair so it looks similar. This also helps when space saving multiple parameters. The third step is to shift all of these variables to have a correct value relative to the next loop. Finally, the fourth step is to initialize everything you used. The zeroth variable gets initialized inside since it's calculated every loop, while everything else must be initialized outside. I can take this even further. I observe that for every x of dp of i, I'm immediately assigning it to the same x of dp i1. So I can just default initialize it to have all of those values already. But now looking at the inner loop, I no longer depend on dp i1 at all anymore. So instead of copying dpi1, I can just reuse that same array, since it doesn't matter if I overwrite it. And if I'm reusing that same array, only to assign it back to itself, I don't need two variables. I only have one array, so I only need one variable to represent it. So I'll replace everything with that one variable, dp. Self-assignment here is useless, so I can remove that. This is another reason why dynamic programming seems so confusing. We can optimize it so much that we can't even see the recurrence relation anymore. If I'm only changing something every time that coins of i is less than equal to x, I can just start the first x to be at coins of i, so I won't have to check. I also do need to index with i anymore, since it's only used to index coins. So I can just iterate through the elements in reverse order. Based on my observations, order of the elements doesn't matter, as long as I stick to one, so forward is the same as backward. Moving some last things around, and deleting these comments, I've finally arrived at a hyper-optimized, extremely concise, and cryptic solution that is ready to be posted on the solutions page. I'm a gatekeeper so I can just delete all of this and I want a title emphasizing the true spirit of sharing solutions. Thanks for watching. I know this was a lot of information, but the great part is you don't have to do all these optimizations all at once. Start with converting recursive to iterative, and as you get more confident, you can apply more optimizations and skip more steps in your head. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe. I'll try my best to upload more, but anyways, good luck and go solve some problems.